Good to see you, brother. You too, man. It's you been, too. It's been it's, a long time. It's good to see you in these bananas times. Yeah. It's been a long time since we last uh, worked together. That was in 2017. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, though. Yeah, I still remember it clearly. I, I mean, I know you're living in New York, aren't you? You're, you're, you're stationed around that area? I'm in New York. I'm in the Northeast Bronx. Um, for those that don't know the area, it's the northern, eastern, most eastern part of the city. There's a little area here called City Island. Used to be like an Italian fishing community when I was young or before I was born, actually, too. And um, it's where I grew up. This is where I even still, me and my, me and my mates go out there and fish from time to time. Uh, it's a little below Connecticut, but it's still New York. It's in the Bronx. I'm just all the way on the east side. And we're not directly in the fray of things. We're outside of Manhattan, 20 minutes or so north, east of Manhattan. So we're not with all of the all the um, looting and the, and the marches and things are going on up here. It's a little bit more residential, but ironically, a little north of here, there's some pretty wealthy areas like Bronxville, which is the 10th wealthiest commonwealth in the world. Don't ask me how that happened in my neighborhood, but it's a little, I don't live there. It's a little north of me. And uh, there's, there's, there's Scarsdale and there's New Rochelle. And un unfortunately, in these areas, the, the COVID scenario was really high. It was the highest in the city. So that that was a bit strange, but well, I, here we I, are. And I understand why God. that. I understand why that would be the reason. I think because wealthy people tend to travel more so than people who aren't as wealthy. So that could be the reason. Because we found that also that in more affluent areas around Melbourne, we're contracting uh, Corona more so than less affluent areas. And I think it's wow. their, it, it's their. Um, their uh, consistency of traveling around the world, uh, you would obviously pick it up. I mean, especially if you're a musician or you're a businessman or you're doing whatever it is that takes you away all the time, you know? Yeah. So we're, we're, we're managing this. It's been a city, as you probably know, it's been hit very hard. Um, I'm sorry to say, lots of deaths. Um, I lost colleagues, uh, dear friends, and one family member. So it's it's been it's been a uh, it's been a really challenging time, and and some of my some of those folks had other issues before COVID nineteen lung or or uh, um, respiratory issues asthma these kind of things. So the situation didn't help. But and in the music community here, you know, losing Mr. Marsalis, they, they went to Marsalis and Branford's dad and Wallace Roney, Onaja Allen Gums. Ronnie Drayton. There's a lot of great people that we know personally that we lost during that time, and that's made it even more difficult to to to, to deal with. But um, the phrase I've been using using is thinning of the tribes. Uh, this is a time when uh, we get hit hard on a lot of levels, and then on top of that came this horrifying murder of this African American gentleman by the police officer which then, of course, sparked a, an entire necessary, in my opinion, flame for the, for the world. I don't agree with everything that's happening, but I do agree that enough is enough. And the systemic racism that we deal with in the world has to be dealt with. You can't have a society. There's no compromise on it. And I think a lot of countries have tried to compromise and do, and do apologies and, and, and um, maybe even offer money. But you can't, you know, I can't come to your house and rob your house and then actually take your house and move in it and kick you out and then just tell you I'm sorry and go back into the house and tell you to have a nice life. So uh, that's been the nature of a lot of scenarios, in my opinion. And it's just all come to a head. And... We don't know what's going to happen because along with COVID, which knocked out our industry, which knocked out everyone's industry, income, folks not being, you know, the, the, the investments, the financial system, the health system, the educational system, everything's being hit by this. And on top of that, we have, so it's a very interesting storm, I would say, happening right now. Yeah, it's so, it's, I think it's the end of capitalism. It's the beginning of, or at least the beginning of the end of capitalism 
in terms of we, I'm hoping that we'll get back to democracy rather than capitalism in our financial uh, status around the world. Do you, do you know what I mean by that? Uh, like the, I just hope the load is more shared amongst people, whereas uh, capitalism, you know, was always going to the uh, one percenters. So I'm just hoping some of that might galvanate some of that and bring it back to some sort of normal playing field for everybody and we get back to some some normality whatever that may mean in post uh corona because i don't know how long this is going to sustain for you know in our society i mean i know that they're opening up things and they're trying to make the economy uh gain its wills again but uh i just don't know the time span i mean can you see yourself touring again in the next 12 months no I think there's no concept for touring right now. I think we're they're talking about a second wave. There may be, see, when you have something like this happen, or something that was nothing like this that happened in the past, when you have something like this, similar to this happen, no one likes thinking about the fallout. And the fallout is basically the reality after the storm. You know, you have a storm and then there's no houses. Um, oh, you have flooding or you have no electricity. You know, there's the, there's the storm and then there's the fear of the storm and the noise and and then you you wake up to you come out of your basement or what have you and there's a new neighborhood and the houses are down and etc. There's going to be a huge fallout. And the, the thing about the fallout of COVID and this racial climate is all of the things are kind of connected. So are we going to be able to be around each other? without having a six feet uh, uh, distancing? Are venues gonna be able to be open? Are venues gonna be able to save money and, and have patrons come back in? Mm. Uh, 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 are we gonna be able to travel on the train station or in the buses and the tube, what have you, to get to these events? Or do we all have to drive? Are we gonna be able to park our cars? If you go into a venue, can you have a drink? Can you use the bathroom? Where is the... You know, how are we going to deal with that? We're going to be all wearing face masks. Or can we go see music and not have drinks? All of these things have to be sorted out because the second wave is going to create more information and a different kind of an impact on society. And I think it's difficult to say. My guess right now is no in the next 12 months. I think maybe after the next 12 months. But I think there's still are going to be areas where we can, we can perform and be creative. And that might be what we used to have in the States in the early 80s when everyone couldn't have afford cable or it wasn't available everywhere so we had pay-per-view and maybe what may have to happen is there may be a venue or two or three that artists go into and they perform with multiple cameras and then like we work like we're talking now people can tune in on their phones on their computers and on the television sets and pay a, f a fee to watch the show mm. that i think is maybe something that can happen sooner than us being able to just go back to the Horton Pavilion or, or, or Bird's Basement or Madison Square Garden, and that we, uh, I think we have a better chance of having an isolated concert than we do getting back in the room together again because there's so much information we still don't know. Yeah. And when those second numbers come around after this so-called opening of the towns and opening of the cities, we have to see what those numbers are going to mean. Are we going to have more people sick and more deaths? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think the only conclusion to that is, if, uh, I mean, going forward, unless we have a uh, remedy, there's no moving forward. We're just going to see more of the same. And I think it's the uh, the fittest will survive, as they say, you know, and which is a real shame because that's the way they look at it because it's, they just want to stimulate the economy. That's how I see it, you know. And if you're not fit enough to... Uh, uh, pay, partake in that sort of system um, I think you'll just fall by the wayside and I don't know if there's going to be any uh, uh, trampoline there to grab people you know what I mean I think they're just going to let th people slip through the cracks And but I'm praying that they will have a remedy and I'm praying that uh, you know something will change and, I, and especially just in, re in relation to what you were saying earlier about race I think um, I was talking to someone about it recently. I was just saying that when you have, I think when you have societies where, I mean, you, we see it in Australia with the Aboriginal people and you've lived in Sydney in the early nineties. Is that cor correct? You lived in. That's correct. Yeah. And, I, and I did yeah. quite a few extensive outback trips as well. Yes. Yeah. And you know, the system in Australia, cause you've experienced it and uh, you, you know how, I mean, 
Aboriginal people weren't classed as citizens up until 1967. I mean, that's in, that was the year I was born. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, I spin out when I hear that stuff. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't think the average white person or the average people in society in, our, in Australia, that is, in suburban Australia, have that relevance of history. And I don't know if that's the same in America where African Americans are included in the history, like Native Americans and uh, like the basis of their history, you know, and why they came to those countries or how they or, or how the white man uh, introduced himself to those countries and what was the ex- at what expense did that come as at, you know, and the struggles through that, you know. And I think once we start educating people through those um, history, just history will teach people. And I think that's where we're missing the the right information uh, to to gain to be open to that history and uh, to be able to. Um, it's like a cup, you know. The, the wider the cup, your br- the wider the information you can you can grab. And there's some people their cup is only so small. And I think that's the challenge we have. And no matter what happens, I mean, we've had world wars, we've had all sorts of things in the last 200 years, you know. How far have we come? That's the, that's the question. How far have we come? Have we come any further than what we were in the mid-60s, you know, re- in reality? And, I mean, I don't know, in, in the south of America, has it come any further since 1965 in, in say, uh, Georgia or some place like that, you know? I don't think it has. Um Look, when you, when you when you have a structure, when you have a, a infrastructure that has white supremacy involved in it, people think white supremacy might just be rednecks or yobs or racist or the Klan or uh, police uh, dark uh, police that are that are that are bad apples, as they say. But that's not white supremacy, really. That's like one of the crackers on the table with an entire spread of food. It's in the school system. It's in how people talk to you. It's in what kind of house you can get. It's in what kind of education you're able to have, what, how your baby is born in a hospital, what medications are provided for people. It's involved in so many things. And the reality of changing it means people have to understand, people are going to have to give up things they're comfortable having, and people who didn't have things are going to not have access to it. And the reality of white supremacy is, is control. And there are people that don't want that ever to change. So Dr. King spoke, Martin Luther King uh, spoke, uh, Malcolm X, Mega Evers, Fannie Lou Hamer, there's all of these great people, in my opinion, that spoke about things. But the reality of it, if, of change requires a revolution. It doesn't mean it has to be bloody and fights and wars. But when I look at history, real history, the only free people of color in the world are Haitians. Haitians are the only people who didn't let any European or any white person take over their country. And look at what the price it is for Haitians to have have that power, that victory. It's one of the most punished nations in the world. There's There's a whole threat about, there's a whole threat about power because we don't, there's no real conversation about existence. You can't have the cell phones we're talking on right now on computers without Coltan. That, 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 that grows in West Africa. Without that, you can't have NASA. You can't go to the moon. You can't do all of these things. There's all of these black inventions of bicycles and tricycles and underwater breathing apparatus and the stoplight. And there's so many amazing things, cotton gin and all of these things African-Americans invented under duress without being able to have patents and all these kinds of things. So, but still they exist and people use them and there isn't any place. So it's a, it's a, it's a, someone described it. It's a, a woman online described it this way. And, I, and I'm going to have to give her credit for it. Imagine you play Monopoly, which is a game that you played. Yeah. At some point in your life, imagine you play Monopoly 400 times and 400 times of you, I'm, I'm paraphrasing and 400 times in a Monopoly game, you get to have all the pieces and the money and I can only play. I can't, when I can't, have, and if I do, when I got to give it to you, and then that's four hundred years of Africans being in this, and, and for the most part, in what's known as North America, and South and Central America. And then you have fifty years of trying to have legislation. So then we play four hundred and fifty games of Monopoly, 
And on the, in the 50 games we play, I get to get houses and get money and get property. But at the end of the game, I have to give it all over to you. So I, I actually acquire it. But at the end of the game, I don't get to keep it. So after 450 games of Monopoly that you won and I didn't win for a number of reasons, how do I catch up to the 450 games of Monopoly that you won fairly and legally? What's the process of that? We can't go back. And you, you may not even want to play another 450 games for me to catch up. So there's the reality of time and what happened and how we deal with it. I don't like to deal necessarily with things about history. I was the kid that got kicked out of class all the time, out my mouth, because I was educated in my home more than I was in a, in a school, in a classroom. My parents had me read books, and I had relatives that, uh, uh, for different religious backgrounds, I had relatives that went to the Vietnam War, and I told them what it was really about. My father was a military man, and I learned about other parts of the world at very young ages, and about politics of the world. So you make a great point about folks understanding it. And, but my point about it is, and there's a, there's a really great woman, I think, she wrote a book called White Fragility. I forget her name, but I heard her speak this morning. And she talked about the reality of white people having to exist and live without the things that their countries build to protect them. When you talk to some Australians, some white Australians, they don't see anything wrong with the country that I've I, I, I spoken to, they said, it's fine. Or oh, Aborigines, yeah, they're over there, it's fine. They don't, they're not educated to the point of knowing that uh, uh, that's one of the earliest places of humankind in the world. There's a lot of information back there that we all can learn from. I certainly did on my three or four or five trips that I've taken. But until there's a reality of, of that, that's why an apology and saying you're sorry, it's, 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 it's not, it's jive. And, and as a human being, what I was taught growing up is my grandparents told me, you watch what people do. Don't listen to what they say. Because they can say anything. What they do is who they are. And if you watch what somebody, if I have to watch what the Australian government does, if I have to watch what the American government does or the British government does versus what they say, it's not the same thing. Because what I see happening is not what sometimes People are talking about it. Some people do still even talk the racism because they're proud of, of the, the terrorism, <laughs> believe it or not. But I have to watch what people do. And I, re I remember reading about people telling Dr. King, take your time, you're moving too fast. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. And there's no comfortable way to have that conversation. There's no, there's no comfortable way to change what's happening right now. It's gonna be uneasy. And it's going to be people, change requires use. you. You've got to leave some things behind to get new things. And both parties are going to have to understand that concept. And if that doesn't happen, then change doesn't happen. There'll be a little thing here, a little thing there, a little thing there. You know, Kaepernick got on his knee, and most people are like, why is he getting on his knee? What's his problem? He's disrespecting the flag. He didn't say anything about the flag. He got on his knee for the very thing everybody's out here now in the street looting and fighting and protesting for. That's the very thing why he got on his knee. Everyone said, get up, just play football, shut your mouth, blah, blah, blah. But he was trying to talk about people's lives. That was the way he did it. Muhammad Ali did it. Jim Brown did it. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar did it. It's a lot of black athletes that said, hey, this is what's really happening as I'm playing this sport. But now it's interesting. It, it, people still don't want to have that conversation. Kaepernick was trying to have. The Central Park Five film, which I don't know if you guys saw that over there. It's a great movie and it's a true story. And I remember, I remember winning a Grammy the night that uh, um, our president, which I, did, I, won't, I refuse to say his name over the air, uh, attended the, the after party of the, of the Grammys and wanted to get a photo with us. And I told him, I told him, our press agent, no way. Because he took out a full page ad and called those black kids animals and monsters and they should be locked up. They, had, they didn't even commit the crime. Ava DuVernay did a beautiful movie about that called Central Park Five, which you can watch on cable. And even though the truth came out, the judge and the so-called president of the United States is still, there's no, they're like, so what? So when you have that kind of behavior happening, 
where does the change begin? Oh, it, you know, it's, 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 I'm, not, I'm optimistic about it. I don't, I don't think it's impossible. Um, it, it's, I, I think it's, um, I think it's like a really complex maze that we're all trying to work our way through and we need someone to inspire us to find the right path through this maze because I've worked with Native American Indians. I've worked with chiefs from uh, South Dakota. I've done, I learned a lot about their um, hardship, how they uh, live on the land, what it means to live on the land, um, that opened my eyes as a 25, 26-year-old boy or, you know, man, because uh, I was just a rat bag. I had no concept up until that point. And then when you get someone who can take you aside and show you a, a different path and you can relate to it and you can see the injustices that have occurred because you're so – I was ignorant and uh, and I tried to become un ignorant. And I think that's the key. I think you just got to find within your heart – a way you can unravel the ignorance. And I think once you can start, if you're interested enough to unravel that ignorance, I think that's the path, you know, personally. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. And I think the best shot we have is, is, is being artist. It's the one language where not a lot of chat has to go on. It's emotional and you feel things. And sometimes feeling things are stronger than seeing things. Uh, or, or having a, a an assimilation to something. Maybe if you just feel it and you hear it and it's music or it's a painting or it's a book or it's it, it, it's a, a, a play you go to, it has a different kind of an impact on you. And I think artists have really the best angle at this point of still reaching people on both sides of the aisle or both sides of that, of that, of that conversation. And, and we're going to have our work cut out for us I think in a really fantastic way, we're going to need to to assist, as artists always do, in bridging the gap and to trying to get people to understand things. The, the challenge we have now is we're not able to go out and um, perform uh, now because of uh, this pandemic. But I think it, 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 that art overall is is one of the international communicators, uh, whether it's Aboriginal art or it's jazz or it's ballet. Or it's the whatever the, the, the Melbourne Symphony or the, the you know the, the, the Sydney Orchestra. It, it, those are all of the things that reach people. The frequencies are higher than policies and and laws and jurisdictions and prisons and police. I think the, the frequencies of art reach um, a more uh, sacred part of our brains and vibrate in a different way and some of the more mundane things do. Totally. I was watching that clip you sent me um, on WhatsApp. Um, I was pretty disturbed by it, to be honest with you. I, I, I mean, I, I remember in 2001, I think it was, there was a massive protest in Melbourne against the, um, I think it was Chogham. It was either Chogham or the um, World Trade Organization something yeah. like that anyway and it was a peaceful march and a detective in a uh, unmarked police vehicle ran through a group of protesters just like what you were showing me and, and I remember that I remember that yeah and and I and I was at the and I was near that when that I didn't see it actually happen but I remember seeing footage on the news that night and I, I was just um I was a bit confused because I thought Aren't these people meant to protect and um, help us? Isn't that their job? And if that's their job, what does it take to, for that person to drive through people who are just protesting peacefully? Now, I, I know I know they get frustrated when people are blocking roads and they've told people to move on and they don't. Know. I mean, I know there's there's a lot more to it, but mm -hmm. but is it necessary to run through people and? hurt people and injure people is it is it what's the onus what, what what takes what makes them have the onus on themselves to do something like that that's what i'm thinking i'm going what makes you as a person human being ir irrelevant of your badge to run through people like that you know 
and that's the thing that I don't, I just don't understand. That was, that were the questions I was asking myself, and for a long time, I still. And when you showed me that, I was still coming up with the same questions. I'm like, what does it take for someone to actually do that? You know, I mean, what sort of person well, that, does that? That that piece that you saw has a the which you can probably find online. The police feed, the wire feed, made it to the internet. It's difficult to say what's propaganda these days and what's actually mm-hmm. news, but apparently a feed is posted where the officers say they're being blocked and the person on the other end says, just run them over. And the guy says, don't say that on the feed live. You probably can find find that online. But there's a feed posted from that very incident that you saw. Um, wow. what, makes them, what, what, what makes them do it? I can't explain that. But there are obviously people that are complicit in the behavior. Just like this young man, you know, had, his, had I think, straight up was murdered, mm. stayed, putting your, your, your knee on someone's neck for yeah. eight minutes or almost nine minutes. And having everybody else watch it, it has to be a culture. It's not a, it's not a bad apple. It's a culture. You can't have, you know, if it's if it's a bad apple, and you're doing something wrong, then I tell you, you know, don't do it. But if you're accustomed, I'm accustomed to it happening, and it's a culture, and you do it, I turn the other way because that's kind of the custom. That's right. Um, very, it's, it's 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 very interesting because along with, you know, the concept is very old and it's very deep, to, in my opinion. You know, it's a it's a it's a British concept. Policing the concept mm-hmm. comes from there's a lot of information on it. The UK, and certainly in America, they were overseers on plantations, which is Chuck uh, a KRS One fellow fellow Bronxite has a great song called "Sound of the Police." He talks about you know the overseer and the officer and how the the names are similar and, they, and their behavior is similar and how they were basically put there to protect, make sure no one gets out of line. You don't get anywhere, and, and if you have to be violent to do what you do, you set a tone. And there, there, there's, there's no way that can happen without uh, um, somebody being able to, any case, any horrifying case of a murder or child molestation mm-hmm. or whatever's going on. If people are around and it's happening, then, then that's a, I consider it a culture. When it's a one-off and everyone's like, oh, wait a minute, that's a little bit of a different incident. You have to be able to have a agreeable congregation of people and ideas to be able to commit a, a crime legally, like the chopping up of Africa. You can't just say, I want to get those gold. I want to get that metal. I need those diamonds. I want the rubber. I got to make tires. I need slaves. You have to be able to sit down, as they did, as we know in Switzerland, and have England and the UK and Germany and France or the countries that they didn't like each other, but they did get together to agree to have a meeting on how we're going to chop up this continent because it has all the resources we need to become powerful and rich. That has to be a conversation. You can't just, and an agree, and a supportive one. Apartheid had to be supported by your government and my government and other governments around the world. It's not just, you know, we're going to drive around in cars and shoot kids coming out of school. We're going to lock up Nelson Mandela for 27 years. That has to be a kind of, you know, you have, you have to have a, a group of folks behind that to, to, to put that, that terroristic game into play. It takes that. So uh, um, you people say, I'm not saying that there's, good, there's not good cops. I certainly know quite a few. And I have friends I grew up with right here in my neighborhood that are FBI guys now, CIA guys, phone tapping, uh, uh, special agents and stuff that come right out of the community I come out of. Their parents were, and they are too. So, And I've been pulled over, and I can honestly say that the times that I've been pulled over, mostly by white cops, I would say 90 six percent of those incidents were fine they were i didn't feel any racial tension i didn't have anybody call me any names i didn't get anything nasty happen it was my tail light went out or they warned me that there's deer in the neighborhood or slow down or maybe they were just trying to check out to see who i was um but i never had but i had you know four percent of the time i did have those uh, racial experiences but if i look at my experiences and my numbers it's 96 to 4. so i know that the fact is that it's not most of them are that way, but too many of them are. And, and, and too many of them are to the point that costs people a lot. Of, it's just a lot of suffering. Absolutely. And it should, it, it should be that way. And I, and, I, I, and I have to imagine, not imagine, but think about the cops that really do work hard, that, 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 that culturally are not on that page, that don't work that way. How do they, how do they feel? I mean, people kind of made it in New York, made a little bit of a, Hollywood fuss about the, the, the movie Training Day with Denzel uh, uh, Washington 
and how he was a cop. And I don't know if you saw that film, um, Training Day, um, and how this 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 one young white officer is his first day on the job, and he's learning about the corruption of being a police officer and what it is. But he decides not to play ball in that film. He's like, I'm not going to be that kind of cop. And and it's an interesting story. Hollywood would be fictitious. Some of the things in there. I did hear about that happened in police departments. And let's, let's be real. When you have access to drugs and guns and, and to, to property, you know, you're lowering the bar for people to break the law. I'll tell you what struck me the most with um, that image was that nonchalant face of the police officer while he was standing mm. on his head. Mm-hmm. It was like he was. I mean, was he on drugs himself or something? I don't. It looked like he because he was very pale and he was very. It was like he was um, putting. You could see his internal energy was just all focused to do damage to this person. He was deliberately yeah. doing damage to this person. He wasn't restricting this yeah. person. He was doing a, a deliberate act of damage, and he killed this person. And it doesn't matter if you're a police officer or not. You should be trialed. For murder, and so should be the show. Should the other three or four officers that took part and just stood by and allowed him to do that, and that's what you're talking well, about. Here's what's wrong with the system. Yeah, that's right. Those cops, those cops. Let's just speak about the Asian cop and and Chogan, the cop who committed the murder, have a history of of reports from 2005 or 2001 handcuffing guys, punching them in the face while they're handcuffed in the car, beating them up, punching them, breaking teeth. There's, 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 uh, there's, uh, there's records of it. They were never reprimanded. So now it's 2020, and look at what's, what's happening. That's why this young lady, Koblachar, I might be saying her name wrong, uh, who, who wanted to run for vice president, wanted to help out Biden with the vice president, now kind of has to kind of step away from that job because she was district attorney. She was dealing with those crimes in that city at that time. And people are asking her, you saw the reports. Why haven't you reported these guys? Why don't you wait to let it get on this long? So, so you know, it's 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 um it's one of those things, man. You know, if you're going to curb the culture, it has to be you know it has to be curbed politically the, the right way. And if things are going to be allowed to happen, and you're going to have crimes, you're going to have people, you're going to allow people to bring drugs into the country, you're going to have drug addicts, you're going to have folks in prison. You know, this it, it's. That's what it is. You can stop Cuban cigars from coming into a country. You can stop cocaine from coming into a country. It just depends on whether or not you want to do that or not. Because it, it, there's this, it, it's all in the sentence. You know, no Cuban cigars are allowed in the country. If, if they are, X, 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 X happens. And there's, there's a lot of politics behind uh, things that happen, both, you know, in Australia and in, and in the States. Um, there's probably more we don't know because those guys worked together for 17 years in the same venue. So I don't know if there was some animosity or something. I'm going to say if I worked 17 years with you in the same venue, I'd have to at least know who you were when I saw you 17 years later. Or 17, I mean, I had to know that's Pete, you know? So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if there's, I don't, I don't know if there's some more to the story. They're not telling us. Some other things are leaking out. I don't know if it's true that the, his, his, his wife is divorcing him, but his wife is the sister of the Asian guy. So they were all connected. So, you know, it, it, this is what I mean about culture and, and having things is not be isolated, not be uh, uh, a one-off. There has to be a certain kind of a culture or something like that to exist because there's photographs of four police officers on a man who is handcuffed, subdued, not fighting back on the ground. And you have four people on top of the guy. Is he trying to get away? Is he slipping out? Is he trying to play from the handcuffs? He's, and he's begging for his life, by the way, in the process. It must have been a horrible situation for uh, George. Uh, you know, just you can only imagine being in that situation to some extreme and being plummeted like that and just and that force upon you you know and you're begging for because i know i'm I was, i'm an asthmatic and when i was a kid when i'd run out of breath it's it's that sort of thing you're looking for the breath you know and um and sometimes you think that's going to be your last gasps 
you know, especially when I, when I didn't know what was happening and I couldn't control my breath. So I can sort of – it resonates with me a little bit because I can understand it to a certain degree when you can't breathe. And that feeling that you when you can't breathe is just so uncomfortable and it's just – and you panic and you really do start to panic within yourself because you're thinking this is the last gasp, you know, and it was for him unfortunately, you know, that was brought upon by other people's um, actions and um, – well, all we can hope for is justice will play its part with that, you know. That's all we can we can hope for. And there, and like you say, there, through that process, hopefully uh, it will bring better people into positions to subject change within the culture. And uh, But that's a – man, that's a long process, you know. I really believe that. You know, that's a very long process. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be long. That's just my opinion. If they want to make the change, they can make it. If they want to make the if, if they want to change the money, they can change the money in one day. They want to put somebody on the moon, they put somebody on the moon. I don't think it's a long process. That's that's the part that uh, uh, we're all intelligent. We have technology. We have things. It's 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 the will of people that makes changes in the world. Period. It's the will of people that makes changes, and it's the will of people that stops changes. But I don't think it's going to take a long, long time because. The, the, the things that are, it, it may because of the, the nature of things and the nature of people, but the processes to change aren't, uh, aren't long processes. It's not difficult to, to look at, the, look, look at the, uh, the policing for what it is. I mean, how many, look at, look at the, since COVID, a, a girl's in her apartment, these guys, police bust in and shoot her to death. You know, the gentleman in, 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 in Georgia that was hunted, basically, and shot and killed. I mean, if you have a newspaper here with, 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 I don't know how many black faces are on the cover, 50, 175 of over the years of, you know, it's, it's not just bad cops and somebody misfiring and I forgot I had my stinger on and I meant to have my gun on. So it's not difficult to do. If you want to make it happen, you can make it happen. If you want to let Nelson Mandela out of jail, you do. If you want to tear around the Berlin Wall and realize that the East and West Germany scenario doesn't, doesn't no longer is sustainable, then you then you change it. You may they may make it look like it takes a long time, but it, it's it's a decision, and it's based upon the pluses and minuses. Now maybe the deals have to be worked out, and um, change takes a minute because if you got people in power that are controlling a certain narrative, and it's five or six of them, and one or two of them change, that's a different dynamic than all of them changing. So at the end of the day, you know that most things are structured behind profit behind money and that's what drives a lot of scenarios good bad and indifferent and when a profit has an impact it changes dr king told the black people don't get on the bus and the bus company shut down there's your math so either you start your own bus company you don't get back on the bus again with people you don't like Start your own bus company. Build your own thing. You know? And there, and there were two times in America, at least, when black people decided to do their own thing. Also Oklahoma. And in Brentwood, where they, where they built their own communities. And they were millionaires. And they had their own this and they had their own. And, they, and someone found a way to burn those towns down. No one got their money back. The government didn't have their back. Whether it was a racial riot or whether it was something, somehow or another, those, those towns are history, and nobody even talks about them. My grandparents talked about it and lived during that time. And it was self-sufficient. It wasn't racist. It wasn't something that you had to have. I, I mean, half my grandparents' generation were fine with, with segregation because they felt like we have what we have, what we need, and we have white people that we get along with, but why do we have to prove to somebody else that we need to? It, was a, it could have been a dangerous time, but their money stayed in their community a hundred times from business to business to business to business. So some people were not necessarily into giving that up to so-called share and be equal and lose everything you had to try to be in the so-called new uh, equal economy or equal rights. You know, my grandparents never wanted to have civil rights. They wanted to have equal rights. And if they weren't going to get equal rights, they were fine with being segregated because they had everything they needed. They didn't need to be, get anything from anybody else. They were self-sufficient, and so were their communities. If you're not going to give me equal rights, then let me just keep what I have. But for civil rights, that, that kind of doesn't mean anything. 
when you're being lynched and you're being shot and you're being segregated homes, you're getting poor schooling and you're getting terrible food and, and terrible health care and no insurance, these kind of things. What's the purpose of it, really? So equal really means equal. And that's a very difficult definition for people to follow. If you look at Australia and you ask Australians, are you ready to be equal with Aborigines? What do you think they're going to say? <laughs> I work for this. They can go out and work for it. That's what they'll say. I work yeah. for it. They can go and work for it. And, they- it and, and, it's, and it's interesting. When people have those kind of comments, you know, that's like starting the footy game at halftime. <laughs> Right, and then saying you're gonna you're gonna play the footy game from halftime. Yeah. But if the score is thirteen to zip, yeah. and you're gonna watch the footy game from halftime, that's it. how did how did it become thirteen zip? Yeah, that's it. Right? How are you gonna? How are you? Gonna, hey, how did we get here? But we just start from halftime and go. No, no, no. This is thirteen zip. That's where that's the beginning of the game. That's where we start. So you know when w- the issue with supremacy and privilege allows people to have those kind of conversations because they feel entitled and not you sort of the the the, uh, the video of the young lady who called the who called the uh, wanted to call the police on the on the harvard grad bird watching african-american guy who wanted to watch birds and the lady's dog was on the loose and she 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 chose very choice words to say i'm gonna call the police and tell them an african-american man is threatening my life. Not, don't point your camera at me, or my dog is scared. No, no, no. She, she went right for the jugular. And then her voice went into acting, and she, oh, I'm so mad. She went into a little thing, thinking that that was going to, you know, she, might, she may have cringed at it watching it herself. I tell you what, she had no problems loading that bullet into that gun and making that statement. She went right to it, right to it. No, no digital delay on that one. Straight on. Boom. In there. So when you think like that and you behave like that, in my opinion, if you want to look at it psychologically, she knows that the, even if she's lying, the police department are going to kind of be okay with her lying. If they have to go down to the precinct, she's definitely going to go home. He may not. So that, that statement has certain types of uh, privilege and racism and homophobia, all, it has all of those things attached to it, 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 its, its delivery of saying that because it's a weapon. That becomes a weapon. I will get the cops on you. And you know what happens to black people when cops come around, especially black men. Translation, in my opinion. So you better back up and not tell me what to do because I'll call the cops on you. Almost like when you're a little kid and you're in a park and kids pick on you and you got a brother that everybody's afraid of. And you say, I'm going to call my big brother because you know your, bro- your brother's going to go kick everybody's ass and those guys are going to go, oh, don't call him. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a racist, um, really, really, really horrifying version of that because in another kind of a scenario, that man could have died. He could have died for, for bird watching. And Telling, telling her to obey the law. The sign says, put your dog on a leash. Just just simple as that. And she could have said, okay, she's, I, she could have said, don't put the camera in, but okay, fair enough. You're right, put the dog on. But she went right into, I'm not going to have this black man correct me, even though I'm wrong. So, you know, there's where, when you, when you talk about change and behavior, you know, that's exhibit A. And it's difficult for, when someone says, let him work for it, uh, uh, <laughs> it, it, he's starting the footy game at halftime. Yeah, that's it. I mean, we've got we've got a woman up in uh, Queensland. You probably heard of her, Pauline Hanson. Um, she's quite ridiculous. She's a bit she's a bit less outrageous than Trump, but she's sort of sim- on the same sort of plane. You know, very basic mm-hmm. catch fry catch phrases. You know, um, uh, goes up to Queensland. Yeah, you know, she's from Queensland and she have you heard of her? Were, were you around? You would have been, I heard I yeah. heard of her. I heard of her. Yeah. And um there was this big push. I'll just give you this quick example. There was this big push um in the mid two thousand and fourteen, around that period of time, and we were we were all going gung ho with uh, alternative energy. And it was looking like things were progressing. And then all these small towns in Queensland 
because uh, that's where a lot of the sun is all year round, uh, they arced up because they were losing their jobs, right? So she'd go into these rural pubs and, you know, rally up the troops and uh, give them this rousing speech about how, you know, we've got to keep with the mining, we've got to keep with the traditional systems, you know, this is your job, your fu- you know, your, your history, your, your future, you know, in your jobs. And one thing she didn't really point – the thing that – the first thing that uh, that I noticed was that she never – went to those areas and got any permission by the Aboriginal people to actually have a, to actually represent the land that they're living on, to have that authority to go and talk to people because she's a politician. But she's not a politician. She's a, she's a fish and ship owner who uh, had this dogma against Asians. and uh, Well, back then it was Asians because we didn't have many African people coming to Australia back then, but it was Asians and uh, Euro- Southern Europeans, you know, and I remember I worked with her at a TV station um, in Melbourne post her um, – because she got disgraced in the early 2000s. You know, it was all corrupt and it was all money swindling and all this sort of stuff. And uh, they, she, she, she came to prominence via Dancing with the Stars. I don't know if you have that in America. Oh God! Yeah, yes, right. So I, she was on that. She was did, on. Did she, win? She, she was on that, right? And I and they told me you have to mic her up. I said, listen, man, I'm not micing her up. <laughs> And she heard me, you know, I, I swear to God. I, and she looked at me and she gave me the dirtiest look and I just said, fuck you, you know, I'm not going to mic you up. Go, you get, and I got one of the girls that said, you go and mic her up. So that was my revenge to her because I really dislike her. <laughs> and I know I shouldn't behave that way, but uh, I just have to let that one. Hey, man, hey, you know, this, this, that's how I felt when, when, when Trump didn't know who Living Colour was and, and, and he and he he wanted to get this photograph because he's, he just saw we won a Grammy and he said, who's that band? I want to get a photo with that band. So that's that's why I came out to say, no way in hell am I going to do so anything with this, with this guy. So, you know, I I understand it, but Australia's an interesting place, man. It was a great place to, for me to, to go and stay and live there for a little while. It, you know, I, I learned a lot about um the states from the outside and about Australian culture and 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 the influence of the of the UK, basically you you guys cousins and um, Im- immigrants of you know Italians, Greeks, you know uh, South Asians and so on, and then the whole Aboriginal vibe and the Torres Strait Islander vibe and so on. So it's very 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 interesting uh, in many aspects and in some aspects historically new, but. Um, it's difficult to have the conversation, whether it's the States or it's Australia or it's the UK or it's any parts of Africa uh, and some even parts of Asia, to have that conversation about indigenous rights and people because when you, when you, when you take something, you mean to do it. It's not an accident. If I'm going to take your bicycle, I'll take your car. I don't, it's not an accident. I, I mean to do it. And I have no desire to give it back to you. You maybe you can borrow it if I'm if I'm going to be nice. But the idea of taking something is for you to own it, for it to be yours. So, you know, building a culture on top of those kind of things, which is we're, we're, we all live in countries where that has where that has happened. Um, as I said, people may not want to be in Haiti and may think it's a not desirable place. But um, and they still people have a lot of there's a lot of foots on that neck. But um, they they are really willing and ready to do what they have to do to, to have the island be theirs and, and unfortunately um, suffer for that. But when you build that kind of thing and you have a Queensland and you have a, a Ayers Rock, you know, and you have a Queens, New York and a Harlem spoke with one A, right? And, and, and Victoria Falls and you have these kind of things. Um, uh, 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 to me, it's 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 the consistency of drinking that Kool Aid. You're still you're still, you know, uh, when I was out there, the Aborigines told me to call it Uluru, never call it as, as rock, which I wouldn't do anyway. But it, there's a whole concept behind, you know. I'm going to assume from your last name that your ter- your heritage is Italian. Well, yeah. Well, you. You're right because we were colonised by the, Malta. Do you know where Malta is? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we were. It was a uh, an Italian colony. It was established by a Sicilian prince, and uh, 
and it was in the south. In, yeah, in the south. Yeah, so it's just below Sicily, basically. Um, right, right. And uh, yeah, so it had it had been invaded over the centuries by the Moors, the uh, the French, uh, yep. the Knights of Saint John. You know, um, there's a, there's a whole history of Malta. Um, it stopped the uh, Islamic. Uh, uh, fortitude into the northern part of Europe because uh, if they had of uh, if the Turks if the Ottoman Empire had of captured Malta um, that would have given them a slingshot to move into the north of uh, Europe and the south for supplies so it was a very vital island and we had yes. and we had the Knights of Saint John at that stage on the island and we were outnumbered ten to one. And we had no ammunition, but uh, what we did was, uh, well, what they did was cut, they'd capture the Turks, chop their heads off, put it back into a cannon and fire it back at them. And it, they defeated the Turks by just freaking them out. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I, I, whatever, whatever methods are necessary. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Americans don't like talking about the Vietnamese winning, but they, they were not ready to give that land up. Yeah. They didn't have half of the things the Americans or the, or the, or the, that matter, the French had. Yeah. But, I mean, so you're coming, you're in Australia, I don't know what generation, but can you imagine coming to a place like Australia and everyone telling you to forget everything Italian about you? Mm. You know, lose the last name. Yeah. Don't cook any Italian food. Don't speak the language to your mother or your grandmother anymore. Yeah. Matter of fact, don't talk about Malta. Don't talk about any of that yeah. stuff. And then have you to be happy and exist in the place. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what happened to the African-Americans, right? Well, for yeah. the most part, it did. Yeah. But um, I feel like we were clever enough to bring things with us yeah. and be, I think, the strongest people in the world. Yeah. Uh, to bring medicine, to bring ideas. There were so many... There were so many uh, uh, cures for diseases that white people got credit for, but there were a lot of plantations where white people were dying by the hundreds and, and the Africans were fine. And that's because a lot of people knew what to do with roots and all kinds of things to build up their immune systems. Mm. The latest story, which no one talks about, is the Jack Daniels recipe, which, which um, uh, now there's a whole thing where the, uh, the African-American guy was responsible for the recipe and then the white family took it from the black guy who worked for them. And then there was a, you can look it up online. There's an African-American lawyer. She's from Washington, D.C., who researched the whole thing and now wants to get the thing back and let the families back into the mix of the Jack Daniels scenario. So it's very interesting uh, a lot of times when people would say things. I'm glad I wrote that information because people, when, when I went to school and they would say, what have black people done? They couldn't shut me up. You know, there's so many things that we, that I knew that my teachers didn't know. It didn't make me, quote unquote, smarter than them. It made them less informed than I am. Mm. And then when you're informed about something, you'll know how to have a conversation. You'll know how to deal with things. When you're not informed, if you don't know who you are, you don't know where you come from, you don't know the story you know about your people and what happened in the wars and so on, mm. it's gonna change your behavior. And one of the things that happened with slavery was they obviously wanted to not have African Americans have any contact to this day, in my opinion, with the continent. Because anybody who went there to see Egypt that had an economy and they had government, they had open heart surgery, embalming fluids, they had all of these things, mathematics, science, they had so many things no one else had. And for some people who couldn't handle that, they destroyed it. And they're still trying to do that to this day. And a lot of European people went to study there. Aristotle and all of these guys to get information about science and mathematics. But Egypt was thousands of years ahead of the game to the point where people today don't know how the pyramids were built. They're even blaming it on the bloody, uh, 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 um, they're saying the aliens built it. There's no way humans could have built it. Whatever you want to believe, you can you can believe. I have people go into tombs and go, no, it's no possible way. How can you line up? How is that corner of that stone cut so evenly? How, it's not impossible. You know, at one point, the three pyramids lined up with the, with the three stars up in the, in the universe, set up the triangle, which, which gives you the directions to all corners of the globe. There's all these incredibly genius things uh, that they wouldn't want us to know about anyway, but it's not possible for people to do that kind of 
work in that kind of creation to have that blood running through your DNA for you to be to be an idiot. You have to you have to break something. You have to, you have to create that process for them for for people to to behave in that way or scare them into it. And you know, with racism goes on a lot of parts. You know, I have I have the same conversations with African Americans who feel like they 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 they're not African. We're not. I'm not born there. I'm not. I'm a Smith. I'm a Jefferson. I'm a Thomas. Don't talk to me about Africa. I'm not, I'm not, I've had celebrities I spoke to, they asked me, why do you go so much? Why did you go to the outback of Australia? What did you, what did you learn from that? And they have people who really feel like, I said earlier, they want to start the footy game from the, from the halftime, right? And um, if you don't identify with that, that's fine. But I know in identifying it, you know exactly my DNA, exactly where my parents, my, my mother's bloodline is and my father's bloodline, what the tribes were, what the names of them were, how they behave. What, it is in me whether I wanted to study it or not. But when I studied it, I understood myself. I wish I had that information when I was in kindergarten. It took a minute, but I got it. And it's, you know, playing with living color or doing music. It's, it's unfearless to do it because I don't make those issues my problem. It is when it becomes a life and death situation, I have to defend myself or whatever I have to do. But culturally, you like you and I, we can have a conversation about it. But um, the, the concept of ignorance, inferiority complexes and all that kind of stuff aren't just black and white, trust me. There are a lot of divisions, even within the African-American community. The talented 10th of those African-Americans who are millionaires, whose children go to the special schools and they have a special breeding, you have to marry into the Jefferson family or Smith family. It, it, it happens with a lot of folks because those those devices are processed. It's like a flavor ice cream. Do you want to have chocolate? Do you want to have strawberry? Do you want to have pineapple? It's just, it's, just, it's just a flavor. But it happens to be seasoned in the Jewish community, in the Italian community, in the Greek community, you know, whatever community you, you want to call. The behaviors are the same. It's the same pattern. You just decides on, the, the, depending on which, which culture you're dealing with, you know, yeah. it's a little bit of hot sauce or it's a lot of hot sauce. It just depends <laughs> on which side you want to put it in. It. But, you know, I want a lot of my uh, 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 white American friends sometimes are appalled and we're all out having a laugh or whatever, restaurant chatting at some of the things other African Americans say. Because some of my white American friends don't think the black community is divided like that. They think we're all into uh, Miles Davis or Michael Jordan. Or we all like the Black Panthers and Malcolm X. Or we all like Dr. King. That's not the case at all. So when you talk about uh, understanding things or things become a unification and community understanding, it goes much deeper than Democrats and Republicans and whatever you want to say or white people and black people or Europeans and Australians and Americans. It's way deeper than that. It's way, way, way deeper than that. That's kind of the surface things we can discuss, but it goes deeper and it gets down to humanity. All of the hair and the skin color and the accents and the seasonings you put on your food and the way, all of that goes away at the end of the day with that. And that's the piece that I think is being addressed now, the humanity piece. That's the piece that people are starting. Because I have to say, man, I'm impressed looking at all of these young, white, and black, and Latin, and Asian young folks out there protesting. I'm not for damaging any property. I'm not for going out and looting. It does solve. It's no problem. And I hate that when someone's trying to do, do, do something really politically correct, that people kind of piggyback on it and make the situation work, you know, worse in terms of the mindset of the defense. There's no reason for anyone to be getting shot and beat up out there for protesting. Although it did happen, you know, as we know, in, 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 in Alabama and places where people just walked across the bridge and they almost got beat to death. Or a school bus rolled up for voting and they were beat to death. Yes. But uh, I am impressed with seeing these young folks get out there and say, you know, no, I'm not going to vote like my mother and father. It's a great post of a young girl arguing with her mother and father about racism. And you know, she, she realizes in the conversation, she, she posted it and put the phone on the bed. She's talking to her dad and her mother and father saying very racist things. And she's, she's like, oh, wow, my parents are racist. You know, like, mom and dad, how can you be that way? And they're like, no, we're not that way. We, this is the way it is. And she's like, no, this, yeah, you're racist. And, and it's, a, it's an interesting thing that she bravely posted um, about 
her experience of speaking with her mm-hmm. parents. But I really like that that young lady, A, did that, and B, challenged her own parents and said, no, that's not, you can't say that about those people. That's a racist thing to say. Well, that's the, so, that's the awakening, I reckon. That's the start of the awakening. Yeah, it, it is. It yeah. is. It is. For the economy, yeah. for healthcare, yeah. for, uh, for our art that we do as artists. It's a, it's a, I mean, even our art, let's be honest. We're, we're in the art of the lion's share not normally going to the creators, right? The lion's share is going to somebody that's controlling that situation. And you, you do a lot of work and you get paid a percentage of something that you probably should get paid more for, as do I. But we're in that situation now where we're trying to change. Are we going to go back, which I don't think we're going to go back to anything, but are we going to go back to um, really, uh, 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 sorry, it's, it's an early, around June is when we start getting people auditioning their fireworks here for Independence Day. So you're going to hear this time of night, once June comes around, over to July 4th and after, um, if you don't hear them, sometimes you'll see sparks and stuff flying, people rehearsing for their lovely July 4th display. Don't get me started on that. That's another whole conversation. <laughs> but, uh, 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 you know, you, 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 at the end of the day, we have to even look at our situation. If we can park what we were talking about earlier for a minute, just look at the music industry and how publishing set up, venues are set up, doing shows, booking shows, percentages, agents, managers, what comes out, how much work is put in. Sometimes a manager is like a title. It's like, they, you know, it, it, Pete, if you're already a great artist, why does somebody have to pay you well, 20% to do something that you're, you are they're just a, they're just with a, your talent? They're an administrator. That's what they are, really. That's what, yeah. you know. That's so, what you know, we have to stop and look at it. I think also many of my colleagues, you know, we haven't stopped since we were 21 years old. It's the first time. It's the first time we really were shut off. Not a vacation with the family. Not, you know, I'm going to go fishing on Friday and hang out. No. Two to three months of, of really shutting off and realizing things about life. And it's been, it's been very interesting. It's been tough, horrifying times. At the same time, I've heard from people that, it's funny, my friends that I really am close to haven't reached out to me as much. And people that I haven't heard from in ages are calling me, asking me, oh, man, how's it going? How's everything we got to get together, man, when the smoke clears. You know, we have to, you know, so that's what I mean about the humanity piece. You know, that's the thing I think we're, we're being shaken up about. What's important to us? What do we really need to do? Not what we want to do all the time. I was joking with my friend. It's like, I haven't even been in my closet. I didn't open it because I've been wearing bloody sweatpants and flip-flops and T-shirts every damn day. So it's like, there's all of these things hanging up in there, I realized, for the last few months. I haven't even looked at it. Do I really need those things? That's kind of, a, you know, a more personal example of a bigger picture when you look at life and you just say to yourself, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you need? That was the, one of the most interesting things about going to stay with musicians in, in West Africa and, and living with people in Mali and Senegal and Morocco. Uh, they had two shoes and one guitar and one cable you know, in, in one or two Jalabas uh, tops. And then they were happy. They were, they were like, that's it. I wear that when I play on stage and otherwise I'll wear that. I, I think so. I think I think some of my Scottish friends have taken a bit of from that uh, culture because that that's what they tend to have a couple of shirts and a couple of flip flops and uh, they live out in the country and uh, they're happy and they uh, do their thing. You know, but do you at the end of the day you have to ask yourself, do you need it? I mean, my life was a certain way for many years, as you know, touring and then mm. go stage and interviews and so on. And I had all these things I need. Oh, I got an interview. It was this. There was television. There's the MTV at the time. There's nights, late night TV. There's breakfast shows. There's on stage. There's after the show. We need the interview, do a photo. And you know, I, I kind of gathered all of these things. When I started going to Africa 10, 15 years ago, I just started bringing suitcases every time out and just dumping it out and let the kids take what they want and stuff because... At the end of the day, I had to ask myself, you know, um, what do you really need? It, it, you know, it, it, as you get a little older in your life, you start to you know, get down to those things. And you, and you kind of enjoy what you have because you can see it and it's there and it's tangible. And you can, you can relate to it. And I just found the musicians that I met abroad in those countries are a thousand times more proficient, better, more in tunes, super geniuses, play 20 instruments, 
they don't, they're not so distracted. You look them in the eyes and the eyes are white and you can see, it's like looking at the, a blue sky and they don't have a lot of things distracted. You can just tell, you can, you can, you know, I was reminded without anybody saying anything to me a lot of times that I was American. <laughs> just from me going, whoa, whoa, ah, ah, but, you know, because I'm, I'm leaving this kind of loud, boisterous, egocentric uh, uh, culture to go somewhere where people were just like chilled out and it's brilliant and like, hey man, how you doing? And, 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 you know, and, and, and you, you know this person's on a level of Stevie Wonder, but they don't want to talk about that. They're like, hey man, it's, it's, uh, it's something to eat, man. How's, how's your family? And so on and so on. And it, 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 changes, it changes your perspective on life. Uh, um, I, I had a, for a very short time, an Indian teacher who took me to a, a brook and I'm thinking to myself, okay, what's the lesson going to be today? What am I going to have to put, drink some water? Like, what's going on here? You know, I was kind of like, we talked, we walked around, went to this book. And then he told me to listen to the book. I'm like, okay, I'll listen. And he said, that's a loop. Listen to the, uh, the water hitting the stones and going down and listen to those patterns. And then, and then start thinking about, and that experience completely changed the way that I played. Completely especially when I'm playing more jazz or free form music. So that's a, I was humbled by that, but it was, a, it was like a massive lesson on my ear sort of being trained to do certain kinds of things versus me saying, hey, you know what? It's all around us. It's there. I can learn from this. It doesn't have to be in a classroom or a lesson where it sticks and a metronome and so on. Here's something else that's really, really hip. And I never listened to water <laughs> the same since that, since that experience. But uh, that's an example of, I think, a humanity lesson in the Did arts. Did you go to India for that, or was that just in America somewhere? That, that happened in the States. That happened in the States, okay. Unfortunately, I haven't gone to India. I've been invited a few times. I haven't gone, but there's a, um, a, a teacher there uh, from there that comes. He has a place in New Jersey as well. He has a school. And I met him by going to see his son play this concert, and then someone knew the dad, and the dad said, you know, who's this guy? And they said, oh, this guy's a rock guy. And then, uh, we started talking. And he said, man, why don't you come to the house? So I went to his house, and we had dinner. And then he was talking about all these patterns, and then, you know, one thing led to another, and I just wound up studying with him for on and off for about a year and a half, two years. And he gave me some incredibly difficult and amazing things to study. But more importantly, he changed my approach to thinking about rhythm, music, sound, he made, the, and he made everything a glass of water, you know, all of it is just one glass of water. And, and when you think about it that way, you'll be able to play what you want to play, when you want to play it. And you don't have to think about jazz and rock and funk, and, you know, I'm swinging now. Now I'm playing straight eights. Now I'm playing, you know, like don't get out of the um, doctrine mindset and listen. And that's what that creek, that brook lesson was about listening. When you hear the water, you don't hear three, four, and five, four, and there's a, there's a ride symbol. It's in there, but the idea is for you to hear it as a symphony and not as individual parts. I want to tap on um, what's been your greatest personal achievement thus far? Wow. My, my greatest personal achievement? Mm. I can't necessarily say what that is, but I can tell you what my greatest personal experience of an achievement was and that was living color being put into the african-american museum in washington dc which i recommend if you come to the states you go see that mm. it would take a few days for you to get into all the floors but i highly recommend it um getting into the museum going a week before the museum opened with my mom and my sister and being with my mom and pulling up in front of that living color booth and having her stop for 20 minutes and just stare at it. Awesome. That was um, a showstopper for me. Awesome. Yeah, totally. Uh, geez, that would have been uh, inspirational in a lot of ways, but also um, inspirational, but at the same time, sadness, at the same time, proud, you know, all these mixed emotions, I would imagine. Would that sum it up? I mean, it, it, I took a photograph of her, so I, I have it, and I always want to keep that with me because 
the expression she had was, yeah, I, I don't know, as I'm the youngest of three, what my mother was thinking. And I didn't want to ask her what she was thinking, but I know she's a very heady person and she was probably thinking something really deep. But um, to be in that museum with all of those incredible people, incredible people, incredible artifacts. And, you know, I grew up in the Bronx and I played drums in the basement and I played in church. And, you know, I wanted to be a professional motocross champion and I played basketball and I was into that. And I, was really, I was a really good bowler and, and I was in a couple of tournaments and, and all of those things I went through in my life with, with, with her always being really like a partner. I was chatting with her about things, about some of the things she didn't agree with. She hated the motorcycle. Um, I wanted to be the first African-American 15-year-old uh, at the time, uh, champion for my, for my bike class. And she came to my first race and I was all excited that she came. And she said, you know, did you enjoy that? I said, oh, my, it was incredible. She said, good, because that's the last race that you're going to do. <laughs> and it was. <laughs> so I had to sell my bike and um, put the money on the drum kit. But, um, you know, How old uh, were you when you brought the drum kit? I was 16. I mean, I had, I had a little bit of a divine intervention. Um, I have an older brother that's like, you know, when you're younger, he's like six years older than me. So when you're younger, that's like a massive amount yeah. gap. And um, my brother was a prodigy, but stopped playing at around 19 or 20. Right around, the my brother stopped playing around the time I started playing. I started playing when I was 16. I purchased the kick when I was 16. And my thing was, Billy Cobham was playing in town and I was a huge fan. I had a huge record collection as a 16 year old. I had about 300 pieces of vinyl. And um, Billy Cobham was, you know, Tony Williams, these guys were all my drum heroes. Even though I didn't want to be a drum at the time, I enjoyed listening to them. But um, my cousin and my brother and my neighbor, they're all friends. They were going downtown to see Billy Cobham and I really wanted to go. And my brother was like, I'm not taking my little brother because he's a pain in the ass. And they talked them into going and I went and I saw Billy and it was incredible and he closed the show with one of my favorite tunes of his called Total Eclipse. Mm. And my cousin is a really big, muscular kind of football player kind of a guy. You know, he, 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 when he walks, people just get out of the way. So my cousin, and he's also like a fearless guy, and he said, hey, you want to go meet Billy Cobham? And I was like, can I do that? He said, yeah. So we walked backstage to the backstage area. Everyone got out of our way. They thought he was a security guard. And Billy Cobham came out. And I was in shock to see Billy standing there. And then all of a sudden, everyone, including Billy, looked in one direction and it became really silent. And Miles Davis showed up at the club and nobody had seen Miles in almost six or seven years. No one. He looked really skinny. He had his coat on. He has big shades on. He looked unhealthy, but it was Miles and I love Miles. So my cousin, who's not afraid, walks up to Miles. I'm like, no, you can't walk up to Miles. And he, and he taps Miles on the shoulder and he says, uh, yeah, my, 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 my little cousin here is a drummer. Uh, and he wants, to, he wants to meet you. So Billy's over here and Miles is in front of me. And I'm 16. And um, my cousin walks me up to Miles. And I can't talk. Um, uh, it's, so Miles is like, does he speak? Can he say anything? <laughs> You know, but that night I went home and said, okay, you know, quit the basketball team, sell my bike, broke up with my girlfriend, got a job at the local gas station, pumping gas, dealing with some transmissions. I knew some things because I was fixing my bike all the time. And um, I worked Christmas, New Year. I worked every day after school, every time and a half to, to get this cash to go buy this kit. So that drum set, which I still have, and I use it on Vivid, uh, I, I played on it in high school through Berkeley College with Harry Belafonte, and then on to Living Color, and then made it on to Vivid as well. Uh, uh, um, that was kind of like my beginning. And I, I seeing Miles and seeing Billy at the same time, something happened to me that night, I don't know what to tell you. And I automatically just said, okay, I want to be a musician now. I'm going to work hard. I'm not going to ask my parents to buy me a kit. I'm not going to ask anybody for anything. I'm going to do it myself. And that's, that was the beginning. That was the, that was the process. And, and, and I became really focused on just getting the kit. And I was taking private lessons with Horace Arnold 
first at Jomas Collective and then privately with Horace Arnold. And Horace introduced me to Max Roach, Elvin Jones, Charlie Persick, Roy Haynes, uh, Blakey, all these incredible jazz drummers, which were always phenomenal to me because jazz drummers just always had this magician vibe where they were these kind of like handsome, cool, styly cats that did magic on their instrument. They had, they had the least amount of drums, but they, did, they had the most poetry. And I didn't want to be a jazz musician when I was younger, but I wanted to be like a jazz musician. I wanted to have that cool thing and you walk up in a kit, and, you know, I mean, you can look at guys like Roy Haynes. Roy Haynes is 95 and he still looks cool as hell. And he sits down on a kit and he plays and there's another kind of poetry, another kind of ballet going on. So I was fascinated with, with meeting those cats and then I was having those cats just tell stories. I mean, they talk, yeah, you know, I knew Malcolm X. Yeah, man, uh, I knew, you know, and they talk about things in a way that's so animated and they have their own slang, you know, something is not hip, these cool cats, this sounds hubbity, this cat couldn't swing if he was hanging, this dude is dry, you know, they had all these cool ways of saying things about the music, whether it was insults, like they would say things, that's the best I've ever heard you. You know, he probably heard you like 10 times, but instead of saying all the other times you sucked, they would say stuff like, man, tonight's the best I've ever heard you. Or they would say, you really sound great tonight. <laughs> you know, all of these kinds of things that I picked up on with jazz guys that, that they would say things, play the room. That means, you know, watch your volume and make sure you can hear everything. And, you know, come on guys, play the room. They said, oh, it's just, they were these codes, you know, we're going to take it from the bridge. Take four bars out. Uh, drop the head. Don't forget the coda. Go ahead. Do it twice on the end. We're going to do the refrain twice. Then hit the highway. They had all these cool lingo things that I was like, whoa, whoa. So it was at 16, you know, that kind of thing was really attractive to me. But that was the first kit. And that was the beginning of the studying with Horace and working at the gas station. And then when I was able to buy my first drum set, I studied full time um, after school. And went to Berkeley. I finished high school. I'm not really into graduations and parties and proms and hats and all that kind of stuff. So two days after I graduated from high school, I went directly to summer school and started my college education in Boston at Berkeley because I wanted to just jump into the next pool. I didn't want to waste time. And that was the beginning, I would have to say, of me seriously focusing on my career without anybody twisting my arm. You know, that was a personal uh, decision that happened. Heavily inspired by that evening, I saw Miles and Billy Cobb. Totally. I mean, you studied uh, sound engineering, is that correct? In Yeah, yeah. I went to Berkeley. First year, I was, I was a performance major, which destroyed me. And then I realized um, at that time, most of my friends in New York were getting record deals. It was frustrating, man. I was in Boston. A lot of my friends, rap music was blowing up. Most of my friends were getting record deals. The rest of my friends were getting gigs with Bowie and Duran Duran and so on and so on. And I felt like, what the hell am I doing in school playing with all my mates out there making money and getting deals? But um, a few people who cared about me told me, that's not your situation and you have to develop your own. So I listened to them and I stayed in school. So I switched to recording and engineering because I knew I wanted to graduate and I wanted to study something I wasn't familiar with. And I was always fascinated with sounds. Um, Steve Gadd's drum sound, Billy Cobham's drum sound, um, Miles Davis's trumpet sound, Led Zeppelin's, you know, John Bonham's drum sound. I was fascinated with sounds also, not only just the music. And um, why did certain records, Hendrix records sound a certain way? And, um, why is it some of the records from the, the 50s and 60s still sound amazing? And I got fascinated with microphones and mic mic placement and putting things in front of the putting the huge plant pots in front of the bass drum and changing the you know I just I was in school and when you're in school I was broke and full of creative ideas and that was the beginning of me starting to experiment with mic and my kick drum putting it through a PA and face having the PA face the drum head and then record my tracks with the kick drum blasting out of the PA into the other microphones to make it sound like, you know, Godzilla's running down the hallway, basically. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of like, that was like the idea that I was, you know, MS miking technique, which you might know of, you know, like the cross situation where you have a Finch stereo, you have it left and right and up and down. And, and you know, I was trying all of these things in, in, in school and while studying drum set. But the engineering 
gave me an opportunity to get to the academics of, of, of my instrument and how I can make it sound better. Yeah. And that was the attractive part because I realized in Boston I could still practice drums, have the drum set be my major, excuse me, recording and engineering was my major, but in Berkeley you had to have an instrument. That's where a lot of people got hung up because they became engineers and they put their instruments down. Mm. And when it's time to graduate, you have to test out of your proficiencies and your, on your instrument. You had to do both. So I studied drums, obviously, with great teachers in Boston. Yeah. And took the engineering as a, as a major. Yeah. Did you end up working in a studio post that period of time at all? Or? I never wanted yeah. to, to be honest. Um, I never wanted to. I felt like when I got out of school, I watched a lot of my friends suffer and make tape copies and work for days and days and reading manuals. And as soon as you read that one and you start working and you're sleeping four hours a night, a new unit comes out two weeks later. Um, I didn't want to work in a recording studio as a, for a living. I wanted to know how to make records. And I wanted to make my own. And then when I could afford it, it, it in the 90s, I built a studio in my house. And I began doing my own thing. But I was exposed to the great Ed Stasium, who produced the first two Living Color records. Ron St. Germain, who produced Bad Brains with Houston, Missing Hendrix Hours, all these kind of... I was around great, you know, hip-hop producers, Pumpkin... Earl Punk and Bedwood. Uh, there were a lot of there were a lot of people I was able to to watch how um, re- records were made, uh, fascinated and, and watch them, and then take those techniques into my own studio. And then, of course, in the usual style, I wanted to bastardize things and put my drums, the whole drum set, with flange unit and distortion and feedback. And how can I make the how can I bastardize the drums? To we already know how a good comfortable drum sound is, but how can you make a sound that pisses everyone off? That's where I wanted to start, basically, Pete, to be honest with you. I wanted to make a sound that would just, everybody would say, stop, turn that off. That was my beginning point. And then from there, <laughs> I would work to, to something, you know, more uh, suitable. Because there was two uh, previous drummers in Living Colour. How did you adjust um, joining an already established band? Well, um, Vernon and I had that conversation. That's a great question. Uh, JT Lewis was before me, and there was another guy. I don't remember his name before JT. JT is a great drummer, still is today. He went on to play with, um, what's the guy that wrote the High Love song? I think that's when he left the band. Uh, uh, I don't remember his name. English keyboard player. Uh, Steve Winwood? But, um, Steve yeah. Winwood. He left the band and joined Steve Winwood's band. Okay. But um, Vernon played me the music, and the first, ve- the first version of Living Color was Weather Reportage and Fusion In no vocals or one or two vocals. The second version of Living Color was um, a little bit more rocky, but still progressive and avant-garde. And then when, when, when he brought those new songs to me, we started talking about Glamour Boys and um, I Want to Know and Love Rears. I just told him, look, man, I love rock music and you know, I'm not a rock musician. I'm not going to approach this music. like I don't put on a rock hat and play rock and roll. I'm going to play the songs the way I feel the song should be played. And if you like it, we're cool. And if you don't, get somebody else. But um, I understood Vernon, Vernon was pushing for that because he felt like African-Americans were being alienated from the art form that we created. So I understand his passion for wanting to push in that direction. He wanted to really push that rock vibe. Um, but in the beginning, I was confused. I thought he was trying to, you know, let me know, like, you know, this is, uh, we're going to play like a rock. We're, you know, like we were spelling it out, which doesn't happen in music realistically. And I like too many things. You know, I, I love the productions. I love what Ted Templeman did on those Van Halen records. They're amazing to me. And 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 uh, um, I, I had all that knowledge and Tony and Ma Vishnu and Miles and Jimmy and Disco and hip hop and metal and jamming with just drummers. Sometimes I would go out in the Bronx. There's a, there's a beach near here called Orchard Beach. I would go out to Orchard Beach and there were 20 killer Haitian and Puerto Rican guys playing all of these stuff, Afro-Cuban stuff. So I was taking all of these all of these things. You know, it was a salad and putting it into that record, in those songs. So my idea was to um, put Will Calhoun into into Living Color, into that music. Uh, I love JT with friends to this day. He's a fantastic drummer. Um, but I wasn't going to play the music like JT played it. And if that's what he wanted, I probably would have opted not to be in the band. But the important thing for me was to give me an, an opportunity to make the songs sound the way I hear them. 
And Vernon was cool. He said, sure, no problem, man. You know, uh, let's do it. And that, that was the beginning of the songs, the way he played them to me, took another turn. Climate Boys didn't sound like that. Cooked the personality, and that's for people we wrote together as a band in rehearsals. But a lot of the songs that he, he brought to the table from the versions that I had completely changed. And then, um, of course, Corey and Muzz also helped um, to change the color and the, and the vibe of the music at that time. But I took it all like I would take anything else on, you know, be honestly. I just was honest about it. And I was young, was whatever, I was 20, 19, 20, and I felt like I had a whole highway ahead of me. And if he didn't like it, I was fine next. Uh, in New York, in this town, we all play in a million bands. We all trade and there's no ego. Yo, man, I can't make this gig. Can you do this gig for me? Well, I love New York for it being a real community. I didn't experience that in Los Angeles. <laughs> in Los Angeles, when you're not available, you go back to zero. <laughs> But here, people will say, you know, I like Pete. Where is he? He's in the street. Wait for him to come back. We just wait. That's, that's, that's the vibe here. You know, uh, they, they, they're not going to say, oh, you know, where's Pete? He's not here. Man. New Yorkers are quick. And New Yorkers are quick and we execute things in an efficient way. But artistically, we're patient. In L.A., it's the opposite. Because I, I didn't realize Vernon was actually English. Vernon is born in London. That's yeah. correct. His parents are from Montserrat, and he was born in, unfortunately, the hospital that Jimi Hendrix died in. But yes, he's English. And, uh, Does he speak um, with an English accent? Came or? to the States. I don't know. Eight or nine years old, somewhere around there, he mentioned to me. He came to the States and, and um, was grew up, grew up in Brooklyn and became part of the, you know, um, the great New York artist, art, art fabric of uh, and. Uh, Vernon, did, Vernon did a lot of things. Uh, he was a writer. When I met him, too, he was writing often for the Village Voice and other magazines. He did a great story for Vibe magazine, I think, on, on George Clinton. So he was, he, you know, he was very close friends with, um, uh, well, we all kind of knew Basquiat in terms of what he was doing at the time because graffiti was always popular with everyone. But Basquiat really put another kind of vibe. But Keith Herring was a good friend of Vernon's. And when I met Vernon, Keith Herring signed one of his guitars, actually, with, with his one of his art stick figures. So Keith Herring um, and Vernon were also, you know, Vernon was in the downtown scene. Mm. And uh, I like that Vernon was, you know, born in London, his parents from the Caribbean, grew up in Brooklyn. And, and um, he wasn't marginalized. Mm. You know, he was a very articulate guy, uh, very well read, mm. was, wasn't afraid to, to read about any kind of, from any author. He wasn't, it wasn't just a black thing, although we all were labeled that way because of the coalition, but Ren was open to a lot of things. And I think we began, we became friends in the beginning more from conversation. You know, we would meet at an Alan Hallsworth show and check that out. Um, we met at some new opening art exposition. Uh, Cause I had a band called Dark Sarcasm, which I had in college. I was trying to get signed in New York, someone from, Columbia Records came to see my senior recital and wanted to sign my band. Vernon had a radio show and I gave Vernon my demo tape and he loved it and he played my music on his radio show. So we didn't begin by, can you play in my band or can I play in your band? And also, to go further back, we met at a club at the time called uh, the 55, 55 Grand. It was a club that had a lot of illegal things going on upstairs and downstairs. But on the middle floor, it was where you saw the most frightening bands in New York that you didn't hear about yet. And one of them was called a band called Bushrock. Ken with the nod on drums, Ray Wesley Grant on bass, and Delmar, the late great Delmar Brown on keyboards. And everybody would see Bushrock. George Benson, Omar Hakeem, this every no one wanted to be seen in the club because the band was so frightening. But you would you would go in there and go, hey, isn't that isn't that and the people would go, shh it was so incredible. So I would sit in the front and just record the guys with my walkman because I'm like, I'm, hey, I'm, this is like class 101 for me. A very influential band. And when I, when I went to see him one time, Jocko Pistorius saw me. I played with Jocko once. Unfortunately, he played piano on that gig. And uh, Jocko had a bass player and me, and he was such a genius, in my opinion. He had about five pencils in his hair and that sheet music on the piano, and he would give us the heads and the ideas of the tunes, and we would play them. 
And while we were doing the tunes, he would take a pencil out and write a melody. And he go, oh, guys, guys, one more time from the top. And, you know, that was that's just drop up the stories. But anyway, Amazing. he laughed at me because he said, you tolerated my gig. But I was happy to be on the gig. So I went to 55 Grand and Jocko stopped me and he said, hey man, do you know this guy? You, sh- you two guys should meet. And all of that time, I thought Vernon was a bass player because I assumed since Jocko said I should meet this guy. And for years I thought Vernon played bass, even when we were hanging out together. And then when they played me Living Color stuff and I went to the rehearsal, he picked the guitar up. And I was like, well, oh, maybe he plays guitar too. I just didn't put the two together at the time. Yeah. But uh, Jocko Pistorius introduced wow. me to Vernon and told me it was necessary that the two of us meet. And that was the first meeting before anything happened after that. I was still in college, and then I graduated about two years later and came back into the city, looked them up, gave him my tape, and one thing led to another. He played my songs, and we rapped, and then I subbed for JT, and then JT decided with his career he was going to go out and start doing other people's tours, and then that's when Brennan asked me to join the band. Mm. Oh, that's a a beautiful uh, introduction by such a wonderful musician. You know, I mean. Well, thanks, man. It was an interesting time, man. Yeah. It was, it was, I think, another kind of a, I would say, black revolution in New York. Spike Lee was coming out yeah. with his movies. Hip hop was beginning to take on major appeal. Def Jam record label opened up. As I said, guys in the community started getting deals. The music scene changed. Um, rap started to knock other art forms out of the way. The graffiti started to be considered art, yeah. which I think it always was, and it still racially is polarized. But that the graffiti scene happened. The punk scene started to get more popular. Yeah. The punk scene in the 70s when I was a kid was more conditioned to one area than CBGBs and that whole thing. And punk started to become more popular. Yeah. It just did. So all of these things, was it was this great melting pot of, of painters, you know, the Basquiat and the graffiti stuff and Chuck D with, with Public Enemy mm. and Def Jam, Living Color, you know, it, it, Puro Ubu. There was all these great, it was a great time. It was a great time where the, the, I think the walls were really down and people were jumping in and out of yards uh, and experimenting with things. And I was happy to be out of school at that time and be in New York at a really, I think, a... Uh, um, uh, a very fruitful time in art. It was a it was a potent time for things that happened. I knew so I knew it was changing. I felt it. And then um, the, the post Spike Lee, the Black Rock Coalition, and all of these things, uh, our industry changed. You saw a lot more uh, attorneys of color, the managers of color, tour managers of color, sound people of color. You saw more women coming into the mix. Who weren't just background singers. I was sound person for the first four years of the band as a woman. As a woman, she unfortunately just passed away. Judy, Judy Marinas. Judy Marinas is responsible for Living Color Sound at CBS. I can send you a tape of our shows she used to record from the board there, and it sounds like Vivid. Long before we had a yeah, deal, man. long before Mick Jagger came in, saw us at the club, etc. Judy built that sound. She didn't get credit for it, but she did build that sound. Mm. So you can imagine how fantastic it was for us to drive around in America in a van with four black guys and a young white woman with a mini skirt on a black converse and, and punk t-shirts at the front of the house. You could imagine how glorious of a reception you received in, let's say, Florida <laughs> <laughs> or Texas. <Yeah. laughs> so um, there's, there's that vibe. But um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a beautiful time. It was a it, it was, the radio was different. More things were on the radio with less homogenized yeah. uh, uh, formats. And it was a great time to, to, to jump into the, into the art pool. I'm very happy to be part of that, part of that transition. Oh, that's a beautiful story. You know, um, it's a real shame. Like, did, did she just pass away recently? Did she? Or? She did. I put something online. Um, you know, Judy had a... Um, a, a, a immune deficiency disorder for the last couple of years. I, I don't know if it led from other stuff she did in her life early. I don't know, but um, it started to get stronger and stronger. The, 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 she basically started to her system started to get weaker and weaker. And needless to say, from January on in this climate, COVID, I'm not saying that's what the problem was, but it wasn't helpful. 
with the virus that's going around. So um, I thank God I went to see her. Steve Jordan and I are good friends. Steve Jordan is like my big brother. He grew up around the corner from me. And she was receiving something called the Sammies. And the Sammies are uh, an award given to people from Syracuse, New York. Mm -hmm. Artists from Syracuse, New York. The mayor comes down and it's called the Sammies. And Judy got a lifetime uh, Sammy Award. And um, she couldn't go because of her illness. So Steve Jordan and I and Steve's wife went to the apartment and they, we did a live Zoom award thing. And um, she wanted me to talk about it. Was, I was surprised. I went there to support her. But she said, no, I want you to talk to the people about my relationship with the band. And I, and I wanted to say to the band, you know, just, our sound, Judy gave us our sound, hands down, hands down. So she went there and then we, we, we took her out of the club and she did our first two and a half, three years of touring. So um, she's she's an unsung uh, major part of the history yeah. of the band. At some point, you know, we owe her legacy. We owe something, in my opinion, my opinion to do something uh, for for Judy's legacy because um, I would be probably gutted if, if she passed away and I didn't have that opportunity to see her at that time. And we we email and text a little bit since then, but sometimes she was weak. And she couldn't respond, so she would have her friends respond for me. But um, she was a special friend, always great vibe with Judy. And um, I'm glad I was able to, to be in touch with her the last two or three months of her life. And that's recent. That's obviously recent history, right? That's like in the last... Very, year. very recent. Maybe yeah. a month ago. Oh, wow. Or so okay. she passed. Yeah, it's, 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 it's recent. And um, I didn't want to necessarily tell the band, hey, man, give her a call. Because Judy wasn't phony, and and and, and um, I'm not putting any kind of a vibe on anybody in the band. But um, I, if she would have asked me to, I would have. Because the guys all called me and said, "Why didn't you tell me?" And I just said, "Man, I went along with the program, and you know, um, I reached out to her a few times over the years when she wasn't working with us anymore. It kind of it was a sad story because the band exploded onto the scene, and when we exploded." the powers that be in the suits and ties wanted to start bringing in, you know, very serious people who, were, who worked with whoever, Michael Jackson or this one or that one. And unfortunately, um, a power move was made that I didn't agree with, but it was made. And and we went on to do other things and she went on to do other things. But throughout the time when we went out gold records and platinum records, we called her up and, and we made sure she got a copy of um, the platinum and gold records. There's one, we did in LA and she was with us and she was able to be at the ceremony and receive a record with the band. That was a nice time. But, um, you know, Pete, those things are, you know, those left out parts sometimes are uh, uh, important parts of the puzzle. She was a crucial part. I'll try to find this tape to my mom's place and I'll try to send you a, um, a digital. You won't believe it. It's from 1987 or something like that. And it sounds like vivid. I mean, the, the, I forgot how tight we were even as a band. So we used to just rehearse all the time. But um, Judy Judy nailed our sound. And um, I think at some point, other than what was said, Living Color owes Judy some some kind of a... A, a, um, a legacy. Beyond a mention. Yeah, a legacy. You know, something I mean, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have to do something, a tribute of some kind. A lot of bands, you know, when the police first played in there, she did their sound. Wow. She helped a lot of bands out. We just took her out of the club yeah, right. and took her on tour with us. Okay. So how old was she when she passed? Not sure, man. I'm going to say late 50s, maybe early 60s, the oldest. Okay. The oldest. Yeah. Okay. You know, she looked the same for many, many, many years. And um, I didn't know Steve Jordan's wife and her were girl, were childhood friends. So when I went to her house for that Sammy's Award, I got to see photographs of her when she's five. And they went to the same Jewish camps and the same schools. And, you know, they had, they had their own, I mean, Steve and I were hanging out, but they had their own conversations. They had the crush on the same kid in high school and they were laughing at all of that stuff. But I never saw that side of Judy. It was always, she was on the road and we both love Italian food. And at least once a week, we would pick out an Italian restaurant on the road and say, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Bongole guy, and she was a whatever, scampy person, and we would always, as soon as we got to town, that's promoted, which is the best Italian place. So we, our agreement was once a week, we got to have Italian dinner. 
somewhere on the tour. So that was my Italian dinner partner outside of the sound thing. And um, that, you know, we just, that was one of the things that we, we did during those years. We, you know, we would hang out and she was a sound woman. So I was a nerd too. And sometimes we spent hours and, and, and used um, um, PA stores and music shops. And we would find, oh my God, this is a 1963 so and so and so delay unit. You know, we both were nerds, mm. sound nerds. Yeah. So we hung out also in, in, in that aspect. And it was fun sometimes to go on find, especially in places like Los Angeles and um, other parts of California. Um, but it's great, great vintage gear, uh, much more and better pricing than here on the East Coast. Yeah. Exciting. Can you tell me a bit about um, your work with native? Uh, lands and Farrah Saunders because is that's your label, right? Uh, I kind of made it my label. It's called it's called um, Half Note, and Half Note technically was the Blue Note Club's record label. Okay, I put that record together um, after touring with Farrell. I, I love Farrell, and when you get into a good situation, you don't want it to end. And I knew it would at some point. And one day he told me, "Man, you have to get out of my band." And I was like, what do you mean he was, man? You're playing flutes and electronics and you do all this stuff and you can't find your sound in somebody else's platform. You're going to have to get your own band and do your own thing. Mm. And um, I took it as a compliment, but it was kind of sad because I was learning so much from Farrell and he knew Coltrane really well. And I got to hear really deep stories about John Coltrane through Farrell. And there were sometimes Farrell would warm up in the dressing room and everybody had goose pimples and their hair was standing out because some things he played were so frighteningly spiritual and gorgeous. Mm. I just never heard a saxophone play ever do that in the room. I heard Coltrane do it on a recording, mm. but I never heard it in a room. And um, when you meet someone like Farrell, who if you are respectful enough, he'll tell you things. Mm. He'll tell you about certain things. He talked about Bird and Diz and Max and you know, you hear rumors about things, but they don't say, no, 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 this is, uh, we, when we did that date, man, this cat was really on base. They're like, what? So there's that. And then Farrell's open. Um, he would talk to me about, you know, my sign, what's my birthday? And, yeah. You know, he knew the stars and the moons. He would say, well, it's going to be a full moon tonight. Saturn is going to be over here. He just like, and he, he would look up in the sky, man. If you see, it, Farrell was into that vibe, astro- astrological vibe. Super genius man, very soft-spoken, very intelligent, and very knowledgeable, and been around all the greats. So when he when he admired my drumming, I felt honored, number one. But um, him asking me to, to move on, to be honest, I was a bit nervous. So I made the young musician mistake of asking him to play my record. And he was like, no, you can't afford me. I was like, oh, okay, you know, sorry. And um, I started putting the record together. I wasn't sure how I wanted to do it yet. And he called me two weeks later. And he was, when he said no, he said no. Like, he took out a sword and said no, you know. And uh, and and he said, who's working on your record? Who's playing horn on your record? I said, I don't know, if I, I don't have a horn player, man. I'm still looking. And he said, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. And, I, you know, old school cats don't ever let you get anything the first time around or when you think you have it. They just won't do it. It's the law for them. You got to suffer a little bit. You got to get nervous. And they want to see what, what you're made of. You have any character because they think if you're a sucker, you're not, you don't have any character and you don't have any balls, you're not going to play the music with any balls, any character. Or you're not going to be sensitive. You're not going to know how to control your volume. You're not going to know how to listen to people. So old school cats, blues cats tell you, they, they, they insult you or they say something to see how your personality is going to be because they really believe you are what goes into the instrument. It's an old school way of testing your vibe. So, I mean, he kind of screamed on me and I just said, okay, no problem, man. Thank you very much. And I hung up the phone. Um, and he said yes. And I called Busty Williams and I called Stanley Jordan and most staff. I was producing most staff at that time. Now, Yasin Bey. So I thought, what kind of record could I make with everyone that I like playing with? So that's why you yeah, have Busta and Wallace Roney. And I didn't have a concept for it, Pete. I just wanted to get the music together and, and put everybody in a room. And I couldn't get a deal because Blue Note and all these labels said, there's no way you're going to get most Death and Farrell Saunders and 
Jordans and Stanley Jordan on the same recording. And that's the problem also with the industry, but that's another conversation. So I went to the Blue Note and they told me, do what the hell you want, which is what I was going to do anyway. So I put the record together myself. And then I went to my friend, actually, it's an Italian photographer who just came, just moved to New York. And a friend of mine said, I said, I have to get a cover shot. My friend said, there's this great new Italian photographer. He just came to town. He's a killer, but nobody knows yet. So he'll probably do it for like 200 bucks. So I go to this guy's studio. Great, broken, barely any English, funny guy, puts on some music. Does my photo shoot in like 10 minutes. It looks killing. And I said, look, man, I got to pay you. And he goes, man, whenever you have the money, bring it back. So when I got my advance when I recorded and I called him and he said, yeah, bring the money, uh, come to my studio. And I said, well, you got a studio now? He goes, yeah, come to my studio. And I go to his studio and he's shooting the um, swimsuit calendar issue of the some NFL cheerleaders. Like I, I went from him having this cheesy room. It was like a month to, to go into this loft with an elevator and security and this there's this, this, this cheerleaders, there's half dressed ladies, and he's got a pencil in his mouth. He's like, Yeah, he's, he's mad. Hey, Will, man, come over here. I want you to meet somebody. And I, it was like, When did all this happen? You know? And he wouldn't take the breath. He, he, he said, No, man, just give me the recording. I never will forget that. So that cat did that for me. And then I took the recording to a buddy of mine to master and get a con- concept cover. Now that I had the photograph. And he's a filmmaker. And he said, how did you make this record? It sounds amazing. And I said, well, I've got a favor here, a favor there. And then he said, look, come back tomorrow. I'll set up a camera. And I want to ask you some questions about this recording. And that's what the DVD became. So just so you know, I didn't walk into that project saying, this record, these cats, a DVD. Everything kind of happened um, with people being very kind to me, especially on that DVD. I have footage of the Hendrix family gave me for free, the Miles Davis uh, it's an organization gave me free photographs to use for free. Bernie Worrell let me use his for free, as did Odette Coleman. I didn't pay for any rights. They just said, what are you doing? I'm broke. I have this project. They said, look, take four or six photographs from here and sign here, and they're yours. Don't use them outside of this DVD. Yeah. So the project was an improv assembly concept as well. And then the music, and then the DVD, and then I had some other music. My sister's dancing on something, one of this, one of the DVD things. So Native Lands was um was a of a, a lovely freak of nature project that I always wanted to do, and not have anybody tell me you can you can't have this guy, you can't have that guy. It was really fun to make, um, and fun to produce, and everyone showed up, and everyone was great, and everyone played their ass off on the record. And I'm very, to this day, thrilled with that recording. It's one of my favorites of anything that I've ever done. Mm. And thanks to this great photographer and my friend Charles, who shot the DVD, it became this. And, and Charles designed the booklet, the fold out, the, the printing, the whole. My, my, my uh, filmmaker friend designed that as well. So, it, you know, friends are forever, as you know, and they're very valuable when you're trying to get projects accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody showed up, man, on all levels. And I was very happy. I was able to make that recording. Awesome. Because uh, I worked with Farrah Saunders. He was the first guy I worked with at Birds. And I remember... How was oh, it? Oh, man, he, he spun me out a little bit because um, I was mixing him and I came in because he started on the Tuesday and I was, my first day was on the Thursday. So he had, he had done two days with a previous sound guy and then I got the call to come in and do it. So I started on the Thursday and I remember mixing, I was just sitting there mixing and um, he came off stage, he walked off stage midway through a song and came up to me and goes, are you recording this man? I said, no. You, you're not recording this? No, 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 I'm not. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and then he walked back up on the stage and uh, played and then I swear to God in about 20 minutes later he walked back down and he goes, I need some more level in the wedge, man. Okay. <laughs> Went back up and uh, I gave him some more level. And then and then the next day he did the same thing. He came down and he said exactly the same things. And then it was fine. By Saturday he was fine and he was wrapped. And uh, and he, and then he had, a, I think he's, he had an Asian girlfriend 
who couldn't speak English very well. And um, oh, the Japanese lady. Japanese yeah, lady. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, she came out yeah, with you guys. She, wow. <laughs> so she, she came. She was standing near the doorway with me on the Sunday because they had a ripper gig. You know, people were jump uh, dancing on the tables a whole bit, right? And um, during Pharaoh's yeah, set. Yeah, during Pharaoh's set, right? They loved it, right? And um, I was standing near the door, and she caught caught me, and uh, she says, "Pharaoh loves you." You do a great job for him. He loves you. I said, thank you. I appreciate it. And um, and then and then this woman came up and she wanted to meet Pharaoh. And I, and I said, look, I don't think it's a good idea right now. You might want to just hang tight just here and then uh, wait for him to come out. And she was persistent. And and she kept interrupting me and this Japanese, his girlfriend. And she goes, you're rude. You should sit down and behave. <laughs> she t- Wow. And uh, it was just that. That's interesting <laughs> because that lady's really shy. That's wow. Yeah. So she um, told her a place basically, and then Pharaoh came out. She says, "Why aren't you holding the door for Pharaoh Saunders?" I said, "Because he wants to open the door. I don't, I don't know. You know, it's like I don't know, man. Like I, I'm very respectful, yeah. but he did a great favor for me because my brother's a saxophone player, and I went in the back room. And I said, "Look, would you mind just signing your autograph?" And he's and he did it, and. The drummer, he looked at me and said, did he sign an autograph for you? I said, yeah. He goes, he didn't say anything about that. I said, no, he signed it. He said, that's amazing. <laughs> he was shocked himself that he signed it. I thought, have I crossed the boundaries here or something? Have I done something wrong by asking for an autograph? <laughs> no, Farrell, Farrell's, you know, could be, all those cats, man, they, they you know, they, they could be moody for other reasons yeah. sometimes that, we don't we 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 trick we're younger and we can trigger things and uh, remind them of something maybe that wasn't so pleasant yeah. fifty years ago or forty years ago. I had to learn that, and it can come out unfortunately on you in a bad way. Yeah. All right, Will. Well, thank you very much for your time, mate. It's been fantastic speaking yeah, with you, and I do appreciate your time. Thanks for a lot for having me, and uh, absolutely send me a copy yeah. if you can. I don't know if it's going to get reposted, what have you, but it's been good to talk about the art. And great to end on the Faros on this note. Um, yeah. He's 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 uh, somebody that inspired me heavily and great to great to work with. And um and and, and, and he's right, he did do a good job. I was I went down there with you with Mike Stern and um he did do a great job. You know, Mike's a bit of a sound freak too. Yeah. He was he was very happy with the way things sounded. So well, you did a great job with us. Thank so you, it's great to meet you, man, and be Thank you. down at the menu. I'm sure in the future we'll we'll have some other things. I'm, I was supposed to come down, as you know, with my band and do a tour down there, and it's going to get moved to some other time. And hopefully, if you're still around, you can handle a couple of dates. So come out and do some dates with us. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be awesome, man. That'd be terrific. Yeah. All right, buddy. You, and keep safe uh, with all the turmoil that's happening in uh, your backyard. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it's happening for a good reason. Yeah. Thank you very much. Certainly, we'll remain safe. And, uh, I'm, I'm, like I said, the, the, I'm inter- interested in the humanity piece changing, yeah. you know, in the in the entire world, everywhere. It, it's, it, it, like, as you said, it may, may take a minute, but I, I still think, like, that's the goal, is not to digress and to get to something that's uh, spiritually grounding and, and fruitful for all of us. Indeed, mate. All right, well, I'll let you get, Cheers, I'll let you get some sleep. All right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get ready to go to work, yeah. so... Um, work meaning you know work on some music but thank you very much Uh, you have a good one no worries all the best to you there enjoy the day you too mate and uh, when I get back down there we gotta go back to that restaurant oh yeah absolutely all the best and thanks again for the opportunity thank you very much Dead when voodoo strikes. Tear upon your head